I am an arborologist uh, with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, and I am also on the tech support team. And today we're going to be talking about bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, this is a very popular disease that's spreading rapidly. Uh, it originated in some of the warmer areas of the country and is moving quite uh, rapidly throughout the, uh, the country. Uh, Peter Vu uh, will be moderating the question and answer session that will occur uh, the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so of the presentation. And uh, some of the housekeeping notes, I think he's already uh, typed into the boxes where uh, if, for example, you have a question, please uh, write that question down and we'll be able to answer that at the end of the session. Uh, and then if you have uh, also have not uh, put your ISA uh, ID number in there, do that in that box as well. So uh, this will be recorded and you will be able to refer to this webinar in the future. So what is uh, bacterial leaf scorch? Uh, we're going to go over a little bit of the history of this particular disease. Uh, and more important, uh, where it's located throughout the country, uh, which species uh, seems to uh, suffer the most from BLS, how is it distributed, uh, how do we diagnose it, and then we're going to be discussing some of the treatment uh, protocols, the management protocols. You notice the word management uh, is used uh, because we can only manage and deal with this problem. There is absolutely no cure for it at this particular time. So bacterial leaf scorch. What this is, it is a, um, it's a condition where you develop a marginal leaf burn uh, on foliage and where insufficient water, where there's insufficient water, uh, one of the reasons you're getting this marginal leaf burn is due to the blocking of the xylem, which transports water through it throughout the, uh, the plant. And in this photograph, you can see this electron microscope of, of xylella, fastidiosa. And you can actually see how the, the vascular system is being blocked by these rapidly growing cells. Uh, so when you do block water that goes to the foliage, you will notice that the leaves will take on a, a, a burnt look. And it looks like a burn. Uh, you've, you're, you're losing uh, moisture. You're not getting it into the foliage. And as a result, uh, the leaves, the margins are starting to uh, desiccate. Uh, they will first start on individual leaves, branches, uh, untreated. Uh, this tree will take several years to uh, eventually die back. What also happens is the tree becomes very susceptible to secondary problems uh, such as uh, borers and also cankers as well. And this is very typical of what you see. This is on sweet gum. You can see the marginal area between the necrotic area and the live area. And oftentimes, you'll see a halo effect. And that is one of the, uh, the distinctions uh, for diagnosing this particular disease. What we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, minimize the symptoms. As we mentioned, there is no cure for it at this point in time. And we're never going to cure it at this time, but we're trying to extend the useful life of this particular plant, of your tree. So here's the history of it. It was discovered many, many years ago on grapes. They weren't sure what it actually was caused by a virus or bacteria. And so uh, last several years, or say 20 or 30 years or so, now they realize that it is a bacteria. And so uh, we're still learning about it. Uh, there's been a lot of research done at University of Kentucky by Dr. John Hartman. And I've used some of his photographs with his permission in this presentation. Uh, primarily, it's limited to the warm areas of the country. And so as you can expect down south, and actually it's moving very rapidly up the east coast. Uh, it's now all the way up into New York State. And so um, uh, as of yet, it has not reached up into the, the cooler states up in the northern part of the country. So it has a wide host range. Uh, most of these species that are affected are uh, in the oak family. Uh, some of the white oaks are uh, affected, but primarily where you see it more frequently is on pin oaks. You'll see it on red oaks, uh, elms especially. And also it makes it very challenging 
uh, when it's on elm trees because you know they suffer from uh, Dutch elm disease and so uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, to distinguish between um, the Dutch elm disease and the bacterial leaf scorch. So uh, what do we do about it? Uh, there are treatments out there that can extend the life. Uh, the most important thing is to identify the species uh, that you suspect that has BLS and you can see Oaks are primarily uh, one of the main hosts. And there are some other species as well that you'll see uh, this disease on now and then. And how is it spread? It's mainly spread through insects. Uh, leaf hoppers, spittle bugs, what they do is they carry the, the bacteria. And what happens, interesting, is the bacteria can actually multiply inside the insect's gut. And so, uh, this, this insect will go from infected tree to uninfected tree. There's also alternative hosts that you'll see out there where you'll, um, it can be uh, seen on uh, Dallas grass, blackberry bushes, it can be seen on grapes, uh, sumacs, periwinkle, goldenrod, and oddly enough, English and Boston ivy. Oftentimes these alternate hosts do not show the symptoms. So it's very difficult, very challenging to, uh, to suppress the transmission. As you mentioned, you know, these are some other monocots and dicots. So these are some of the symptoms. Uh, what's very interesting, and many people are sort of tricked, uh, this disease will actually, um, the plants will leaf out normally in the spring, and sometimes uh, non-professional homeowners will then, uh, you know, think that this disease is no longer affecting their trees. But uh, they'll leaf out normally, but as we start to get into the drier months of the of the season, you'll start to see some of this necrosis develop. You'll see this reddish and brown uh, area um, where you see at the transition zone from healthy to dead tissue, you'll see what we call as a halo. And oftentimes that halo is bright yellow, and it'll vary from species to species. So uh, the, the scorch usually develops like July, August, September. You'll see that in the early, up to the early fall. And one of the uh, problems that trees have, in a sense, is that they respond to an invasion. And trees will actually produce what we call a tyloses. And as you can see in the electron microscope, these tyloses are growing um, inside the xylem, and they're actually blocking off or they're walling off uh, the invasion of the uh, of the uh, bacterial leaf scorch pathogen itself, and this is just a normal defense response that most trees have. Elms also produce tyloses when they're being invaded by Dutch elm disease, and what exacerbates the symptoms is if we are in a severe drought stress condition, um, or there's been some damage, there's some uh, compacted soil or mechanical damage or the tree is under stress, let's say, from de-icing salts or just in a limited uh, growing space. And usually you'll see in the, what we call the tree lawn area, that's the area between the sidewalk and the curb, oftentimes you'll see uh, trees growing in that environment uh, to show um, symptoms. So there's many, as we all know as arborists, there's many different factors that can cause very similar symptoms, as we mentioned about the root salt and root damage. So we've got to really to try to distinguish between the biotic and the abiotic um, problems. So some of the abiotic would be construction, as we mentioned, drought, uh, underwatering, overwatering with flooding can cause these very similar symptoms. And some of the living causes Primarily are, uh, are in, in, uh, insects. Um, you could get mite injuries. Uh, you can get viruses and other pathogens. So how do you distinguish between these? So when a tree is struggling from just, say, just straight wilt, uh, which is normally, uh, normally you see that when a tree is under drought stress, uh, what you'll see is the leaves are actually curled and wilted. We are in bacterial leaf scorch. You're really not seeing a, a wilting of the foliage. Oftentimes, you're just seeing uh, the leaf showing the scorch symptoms, but you're not you're not seeing the flaccidity or the wilting of the individual leaf. 
So you'll see drought where the, uh, like we mentioned, the leaves will droop. Uh, Dutch elm disease, you will actually see like the cupping. But another time, another thing you have to remember is that Dutch elm disease occurs earlier in the season, uh, rather uh, compared to BLS, which happens and the symptoms show up later on in the season. Oak wilt, which is uh, fairly new to this area, but it is moving into the, uh, the East Coast area. Uh, they do not have the, health, the halo. They don't have those reddish bands. And the other thing about oak wilt is these red oak trees will die very, very quickly uh, compared to bacterial leaf scorch, where it may take several years for the, uh, the disease to take over. So how do you determine whether you have bacterial leaf scorch? One of the surefire ways is you, know, you check for some of the symptoms out in the field. But if you want to make a positive ID, uh, there's several sampling tests that you can take. Um, what you need is 25 to 30 leaves with the petioles attached to the twigs. And you want those, those samples to be very fresh. You want to overnight them. There's many universities that, that can do the sampling. Um, there's the University of Kentucky. Uh, they do the sampling down there to confirm uh, the diagnosis. How do we manage this problem? Very difficult. Remember, as we say, there is no cure, but what we can do, we can deal with the symptoms, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, one of the most important things to do is to monitor, uh, like any insect disease problem, early detection is really key. Uh, how do we suppress the pathogen? Oxytetracycline is the product, the active ingredient used in Bacistat, and this is actually injected, and this is a water-soluble product. Uh, the benefits to that is you get very, very little phytotoxicity issues, none at all, actually. Uh, you get very rapid uptake. Uh, these come in water-soluble packets that are pre-mixed uh, for your convenience. And one of these containers contains 20 of them uh, that will treat up to 100 dBH inches. And we don't want to be using uh, these treatments on trees that have a, a diameter of less than uh, six inches. So one of these packets, if you do the math, will actually treat five dBH inches. And how do we apply it? There's two different ways. You can apply it to the, the system on the left, which is called the Q-Connect. Uh, the Q-Connect is a plugless system. Uh, it is uh, actually injected into the root flare. And uh, it's very simple to do. You drill a hole, you insert the T, and you pressurize the, the tank, and this system uh, may not take any more than 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes to uptake because, because we're putting in a small volume of water and of, of uh, Bacostat mix. Uh, there's another method that you can use. It's called a macro infusion, but it's not using gallons and gallons. We may be using one to possibly two gallons of product, and you're, um, you're doing the same system. The tubing system is a little bit different. Um, we're trying to get very good, uh, even distribution by using a little bit more water. So those are the two systems that are primarily used. One thing that we recommend is you do not want to do the treatments once you see the symptoms. Uh, we, we would like you to see to get the treatments in, uh, in June, uh, no later than the end of June or July 1st for the most effectiveness. Um, and you will most likely find yourself repeating this injection treatment every year. How do we apply it? We apply it to the Q-Connect plugless system. And how do we determine the dose? We take the diameter, which we take at four and a half feet above ground, and we divide that by two. Uh, that will tell us the number of injection sites. Uh, we're using one of the water-soluble packets. Um, in a very little amount of water, actually, one and a half ounces of water, or 45 mils, and that will actually treat five uh, dBH inches. And we, put, we place the product in the cube bottle. We try to make even distribution. Whenever you're doing root flare injection, no matter what you're doing it for, for emerald ash borer, for Dutch elm disease, you want to equal, evenly distribute and space out the injection sites to get the best possible distribution. 
where we're using macro infusion, we would like to uh, combine that with uh, about 26 ounces of water for every packet. We're using more water to get uh, more, uh, more distribution. Either system works well. Uh, this is the Q-Connect system. There's lots of other products that you can use with this. So um, it's quite versatile. So what can we expect? What we're doing is with the, with the oxytetracycline or the Bacostat, we are suppressing the pathogen. So the more we suppress the pathogen, uh, we'll see less symptoms, we'll see the less scorching of the foliage. And this will only give you one year of residual, so there is some concern on pe uncertain people where you're drilling that tree every year um, to suppress this, uh, you know, the symptoms. Um, trees have their ways of dealing with wounding. Uh, we prefer not to do this on an annual basis, but trees have a way of compartmentalizing and overcoming their wounds. Uh, we prune trees every year. That's a wounding. We put in eye bolts when we do cabling. Um, so there's lots of different ways trees are wounded, but they all seem to have a way of, of somewhat uh, callousing and dealing with these injuries. Uh, we can get some pretty good results from some of the treatments, and I've got some data. Uh, most of this is from Dr. John Hartman from the University of Kentucky. And you'll see in this example on this photo on the left, uh, this tree was evaluated on, um, on October 19th in 06. And the rating, the scorch rating, is 90% of the foliage was scorched. Uh, the tree was treated. And you can see on the results of that, it went all the way down from 90% to 20% in one in only one year. Uh, this tree on the left was rated, as you can read, 75% uh, scorch. And the following year, it went down to 50% uh, leaf scorch. Now, what happens if there is no treatment? So these are untreated controls. You see the tree on the left. Uh, we've got an 80% rating, and with no treatment whatsoever, the, uh, the scorch rating increased 10%. So you can see uh, there's a clear difference between treated and untreated. So here's an example of untreated as well. The tree will decline if you don't do anything. There's other treatments. This is a three-pronged approach. Uh, you, you can suppress the pathogen, which we just went over. But there's other ways of helping a tree deal with a stressful situation. Uh, and how do we deal with drought stress? Obviously, we want to supply water. Um, you'll get more symptoms if we have not enough water in the soil and the, the water in the foliage is lost. We can mulch. Mulching has a lot of benefits. It conserves soil moisture. It suppresses weed growth. It moderates the soil temperatures. It breaks down and, in, and enhances the organic matter level in the soil. So mulching is, is recommended. If possible, it would be advantageous to mulch from the trunk of the tree out to the drip line, uh, providing the, the client would uh, allow that. That is the best for the tree. And how do we improve the root system? There are lots of different ways. Uh, the air spade, which is a relatively new tool, has been around for 20 years or so. Uh, is used to decompact soil. Uh, while the soil is being decompacted, uh, compost material is also incorporated into the open soil along with um, nutrients that are missing, uh, which can be determined by a soil analysis. And then the growth regulators. Growth regulators are very interesting. They've been around for quite a while. Canvas that is used um, on, tr on trees that we, we want to slow down in growth. But at the same time, when you're slowing down tree growth, the energy that that tree has goes in other areas. And one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, discoveries that we've made is that suppress the vegetative growth, the growth will go into the fine root development and defense mechanisms. So chemistat, act, actinvidians, paclobutrazole will reduce growth depending on the species 30 to 70%. And that will give you three years of regulation. And what we're trying to do is reduce uh, the amount of leaf surface area um, and so to, to slow down the moisture loss. 
We're also trying to create a thicker leaf and a leaf that will conserve the moisture, at the same time developing roots. And, and this is a, a photo of, uh, that Gary Watson took on the trial that he did at Morton Arboretum. You can see the difference between untreated control with no canvastat and looking at the root development compared to the treated. So with this more fibrous root system, you're going to be able to um, pick up more soil moisture and you're going to sort of delay uh, a lot of the symptoms caused by bacteria like leaf scorch. Another thing that Chemistat does is it increases the thickness of the leaf. And so the thicker the leaf, uh, you'll have a, a lot less moisture loss. And also on the surface of the leaf are these tiny microscopic trichome hairs. The more trichome hairs that you have on the leaf surface, you'll also uh, reduce the amount of moisture loss as well. Uh, more abscisic acid is being produced, and the higher levels of abscisic acid will actually cause the stomates to close, and, and that will also uh, suppress the uh, and slow down the movement of gases and reduce the amount of moisture loss in, in a plant, in a leaf. Uh, you can see also um, the leaves might be slightly smaller. Um, this is red oak, and if you were ever to try chemistat, I would definitely try it on a red oak. They respond quite well. Uh, they create a better looking plant, a glossier leaf, a thicker cuticle, and a uh, shorter, uh, shorter elongation, uh, stem elongation, and the leaves might be slightly smaller as well. This is an experiment that Bartlett Tree Experts did. This is courtesy of Bruce Frederick from Bartlett Tree Experts. This is a, an infected oak uh, with BLS. It was treated with canvastat alone, and you can see about one year later after treatment the difference. Uh, the canvastat actually created a more fibrous root system, was able to hold off. It's like again, this is not a cure, but this has held off some of the symptoms uh, caused by bacterial leaf scorch. So these are some of the uh, the take-home messages: is uh, we want to uh, uh, combine the canvastat with with the actual treatment of Bacostat. Uh, it also is a good idea to uh, supplement your, your watering uh, on these trees that are currently infected. So how do we deal with the drought stress? Uh, what we do is we, um, we, wanna, we wanna make sure that we anticipate this in advance um, to try to hold off the symptoms. The other three-pronged approach is how do we deal with the vectors? Uh, what is causing the distribution of this particular disease? And most of them are the insects that are, um, they're xylem feeders, and they're, they're sucking, they're homoptera. They're feeding on infected plants, and then they're flying and traveling to uninfected plants, spreading the pathogen. And how do we do this? Uh, we can do this where you, um, you could apply systemic insecticides, and they're very easy to control. Zytec, which is a metacloprid, is, can be applied as a soil treatment, um, a soil injection, a soil drench, or you can actually inject a metacloprid into the root flare. And all of these vectors will be controlled. Uh, that, that would be, you know, that would be my suggestion mainly because they are going to spread this disease, uh, and not only from tree to tree, but they're also going to be spread uh, the actual pathogen from some of these alternate hosts that I mentioned, some of the, uh, some of the perennials, some of the grapes, and uh, ground covers and what have you. So if we, theoretically, if we reduce the number of vectors, we're gonna reduce the amount of, um, uh, of inoculum that's spread from, uh, from tree to tree. So, but don't expect this to be the, um, you know, the remedy for the, um, for the particular disease. We've got to really do the treatments. How do we do these treatments? We use the, uh, the canvastat. We can use it as a drench, or we can actually inject it into the, into the soil. Um, one, so one thing that you want to do in order to get started um, in this, you have to know your costs. And I apologize, I've got some costs in this particular presentation that I have not, not updated. 
but I just want to give you some idea of the process and not necessarily focus on the costs of the products. Uh, one thing that we can do at Rainbow is that we can supply you with marketing uh, material. These are uh, brochures, door hangers that we can give to you, that you can give to your clients to explain all the different treatments that are available uh, and help you sell uh, the service, sell the treatment. So this is a multi-year approach, like we mentioned. This is not something that's going to go away with one treatment. We, we said this time and time again, there is no cure. And setting the expectations, you know, that's really what it really comes down to. Um, and so here's an idea of what you can do. Uh, this is knowing your product costs, knowing what your Bacostat, Canvastat, and Zytec costs on a DBH uh, level. So I apologize, these are based on 2008 price lists. And I think in some cases, a lot of these prices have actually come down. And so I would uh, probably say that these prices are a little bit on the high side. So you will get lower prices than this. So how do we price this? For example, <clears throat> you price this, maybe you do it over a three-year period. You know, you look at this tree, for example, a 12-inch pin oak. Uh, based upon the DBH, these are your product costs. This would be your markup if you're marking this up as an arborist. And this would be the treatment costs. Okay? So for year one, your, your product costs are $232.92. Now year two, we would not recommend the canvas that because keep in mind canvas that has a three year residual. So we're eliminating the canvas that year two and year three. So to give you an example, this is what the cost would be for a three-year program, 567, 70, 72. So you can break it down for the client. This is what you're paying um, the cost per day amortized over three years. So these are some things that we can work with you on. And, uh, and that's the end of the presentation. And I just hope that you, um, uh, if you have any other, uh, any other questions, uh, please write them in in the chat box. Also, if you are uh, interested in dealing uh, with this problem, want a little bit more personal care, uh, feel free to contact me. And I'm going to give you my name and my cell phone number. And I'd be more than willing to help you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Also keep in mind, Rainbow has, has territory managers all throughout the country. And you can easily reach out to them um, and, and ask for their assistance as well, because they are all quite proficient in dealing with this particular disease. And I think I'm, I'm available right now to take some questions. And uh, Peter Vu is going to be moderating the, um, uh, the question and answer period. So Peter, do um, um, you um, want me to do anything right now? All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, we do have one question here uh, from Albert. Uh, what nutrient factors help to suppress DLS? What nutrient factors? The only way you can really determine that is, is just take a soil sample. Uh, you can't tell what's deficient by looking at the tree. Uh, we all know that oaks have a tendency um, to develop a chlorosis, iron chlorosis due to higher soil pHs. But my answer to that is take a soil analysis and provide a prescription fertilization treatment because not all macro and micronutrients may be deficient. You'll have to determine that from a soil analysis. All right, thanks a lot. Um, and if you do have any other questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, doesn't look like there are any uh, right now, uh, but we'll stay on the, oh, looks like one just came in. Uh, when is the best time to apply tree growth regulators? Tree growth regulators can be applied anytime the soil is not frozen. Um, I have applied tree growth reg regulators up into the month of December. As long as the ground's not frozen, in some areas of the country, especially in the mid-Atlantic and the south, it's applied year-round. Um, one thing, if you apply a tree growth regulator right now, let's say you're using Canvastat, 
it's going to take a while for that product to become uh, activated in its tree. Most likely, applying a growth regulator right now in late May, early June, you most likely are not going to see the beginning of the symptoms until late this summer or early fall, but more uh, it would be more evident in the early spring. And that is Canvastat. There are other growth regulators that are foliar applied, and that product is called TrimTech. That will be seen in a matter of weeks. Uh, so that's a foliar applied growth regulator. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and so Jeff and I will stay on the line here for a couple more uh, seconds. Uh, if you have any questions, continue to type those in. Um, Otherwise, uh, we will we uh, will be ending in a couple minutes here. So uh, again, feel free to type those questions in if if you have any. And uh, if there aren't any that come to mind, uh, you can certainly reach out to Jeff. He did type in uh, his phone number, um, or you can reach out to uh, Shannon Herbst, who's also the uh, who's the territory manager uh, out in the Mid Atlantic uh, states. There, you can reach out to her if you have any additional questions, uh, or if you want more one-on-one uh, -on -one training. Uh, around bacterial leaf scorch uh, or any other plant healthcare topics. One thing at Rainbow, what we do is a lot different, um, is um, we want to make sure our clients are successful in business. Uh, we just don't sell you the equipment. We don't sell you the product and say good luck. Uh, we take the time. We spend the time with you. And most of these, uh, most of the training is done in in in-house. Uh, in the office and we'll actually go out into the field and we'll get out there and we'll actually show you how to do the treatments. Our goal is for you to become successful and do it the right way and, and that's my job. I enjoy getting out there, work with clients. I learn something new every day. Believe me, I've been doing this for many years and I learn something new every day. So I really look forward to helping clients, uh, sharing ideas, sharing opinions. And uh, my goal is to make you, you successful. And that's the whole rainbow philosophy. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will be sending out uh, the, uh, an email with a recording uh, of this webinar, so you can use that as reference. Um, there is a post-survey uh, that fo follows immediately after um, this uh, webinar. So if you could take a, a couple of minutes and fill that out, that would be much appreciated. Uh, we're always looking at ways to improve what we do here at Rainbow. So thanks, thanks again for joining us today, and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody, for attending.